This week on Jerusalem Dayline, riots on Israel's holiest and most contested site, the Temple Mount. Plus, Russia makes a bold military move into Syria. What will this mean for Israel and the Middle East? And an update on Christians in Iraq who fled ISIS one year ago. How they're keeping the faith. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The U.S. criticized Israel this week for the upsurge in Muslim violence on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. But Israel says it's not the one making trouble. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. The most recent flare-up on the Temple Mount, known to Muslims as the Haram al-Sharif, started on the eve of the Jewish holidays. Rioters prepared in advance and attacked police four days in a row. Earlier, police spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld told reporters how it works. From inside the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, Muslims that are throwing petrol bombs and stone and desecrating their own mosque and then attacking our police officers, so our police officers have to respond. Women hurl abuse and objects at visitors to the Al-Aqsa compound, which includes the Golden Dome of the Rock. Tourists that have walked around the Temple Mount, Jewish uh, individuals that are walking around on the Temple Mount, that are causing no threat whatsoever, they've been attacked, stones have been thrown at them. The Dome of the Rock is the oldest Islamic structure in the world. It was built in 691 on Mount Moriah, where the Bible says Abraham sacrificed Isaac. But long before there was a Muslim shrine and mosque, two consecutive Jewish temples were built there in Bible times. Now Palestinians say Jews and non-Muslims have no right to pray there. That's the current status quo. Last week, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Ya'alon outlawed two organizations causing trouble on the Temple Mount. Recently, CBN News encountered a hostile group of men and women in the old city who were prevented from going up to the mount. I don't like Jewish. I don't like Jews. This is the mosque. This is our house. That's for the Muslims. In response to the recent hostility, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the status quo would remain. And because it's such a contested site, it's likely the unrest will continue. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Temple Mount, Jerusalem. The Russian bear is on the prowl again, and this time in one of the most dangerous regions of the world, the Middle East. The Pentagon says that Russia is engaged in a military buildup inside Syria, including setting up an airbase. The Russians have also reportedly sent in tanks and artillery, and military flights are arriving every day with more supplies. Dale Hurd has the story. With an old ally Bashar al-Assad on the ropes in the fight against ISIS and other rebel groups, the Russians are building a strong military presence near the Syrian naval port of Latakia, an airbase protected by tanks and heavy armor. We, like you, are watching this uh, with concern. Um, we don't truly understand yet what it is that Russia is going to do um, in Syria. We continue to monitor this closely. There is a degree of uncertainty about their, their intentions that continue to concern us. But in point of fact, U.S. officials have a very good idea about what Russia is up to in Syria. They're building a forward operating base that will host Russian combat aircraft and housing for as many as 1,500 Russian military personnel advisors, instructors, logistics personnel, and pilots, along with sophisticated weapon systems. Syria's ambassador to Russia on Monday called talk of a Russian troop presence in Syria a lie. But Pentagon officials have told the press that Russia has already sent artillery and seven T-90 tanks to the Syrian airfield near Latakia. Critics call this yet another major strategic blunder by the Obama administration. U.S. presidents dating back to Harry Truman have used threats to keep the Russian army from gaining influence in the Middle East. But that may be precisely what is happening now. Perhaps because the Kremlin views Barack Obama, in the words of a Wall Street Journal editorial, as a pushover. Dale Hurd, CBN News. We just got back from Kurdistan where we talked with retired General Jay Garner about what the Russian involvement means for the region. They being put in airstrikes against rebel forces while we're putting in airstrikes against Assad forces. How do you deconflict all that? And it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tinderbox. I mean, it could cause some great, great problems between the two of us. And ground troops, uh, the big complication there would be if he's, he's fighting rebel forces that we, that we have uh, 
or advising or we've trained or something like that. Well, joining me now to talk more about the disturbances on the Temple Mount and the Russian military buildup in Syria is CBN News correspondent Julie Stahl and CBN senior editor John Waggy. Uh, Julie, first of all, what's going on on the Temple Mount? Who's behind it and what's behind all these disturbances? Chris, we, we have uh, kind of an ongoing battle there. It's never really completely quiet there. You have quiet days and things then also they, they, um, they flare up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's basically the Islamic movement of northern Israel. They are actually paying people to to riot on the Temple Mount. They pay the women to yell and scream and, and make visitors' visits unpleasant. They pay the men to to store up rocks and fire bombs and throw them at at people. Mm -hmm. So it's it's basically a concerted effort, also on the the part of uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, to really fuel trouble on the Temple Mount and conflict between Israel and, uh, and uh, the Muslims. And, and John, to you, one of the biggest things I think in a long time is the fact that the Russians are actually having a major military buildup inside Syria. What are the implications for the Middle East and for Israel? All the presidents virtually have tried to keep Russia out of the Middle East. It's been a major goal of this region of the world from the United States perspective to keep Moscow out. That is not happening now. And I believe Putin is testing President Obama. He's testing the rest of the West. To some measure, he's tes testing Israel as well because he wants that port of Latakia on the Syrian coast. He wants a Russian presence there. He wants to build it up, not contract it. And he's going to keep taking steps forward uh, every way he can. And sort of he's aligning himself with Assad, obviously, because he wants to protect the regime. He wants to protect the Assad regime, and Russia has all kinds of deals in the works with Iran. And so uh, you've got they, them aligning with the, the Shiite force from Iran, and Putin is more than happy to get in the mix uh, in the void that has truly been left by the United States. Is there, is there biblical ramifications to having Russia come in and a very uh, uh, strong presence inside Syria? Well, they, I mean, people are rereading Ezekiel 38 right now where Rush and Gog and, mm -hmm. uh, come in and invade the land of Israel. There are prophetic implications to everything going on right now, Chris, and, and whether you can uh, put it to a specific chapter or scripture right now, that's, that's more of an open question. But what is what we know is happening is that it is getting less and less stable, more and more uh, of a widening regional conflict that could just explode at a, several different flashpoints at any time, uh, which you know obviously well from just being back from Kurdistan. Yeah, so. I, I can add that uh, we just got back from Kurdistan just a few days ago. We were on the front lines with the Peshmerga, the Kurdish military, and uh, we were literally about 500 meters to a kilometer away from the front lines of ISIS. And uh, right now, in many ways, it's a static line. I mean, they have regained most of the territory the Kurds lost originally when ISIS came in, but they haven't advanced a whole lot except maybe in the West with what's called the PKK. But I, I think one thing that the Kurds were telling us, please give us the arms and weapons that we need to fight ISIS. And they're really not getting the, the arms and the weapons they've asked for for more than a year from the United States. And that's the first thing. The other thing, we went to a Yazidi refugee camp. You know, the Yazidis actually were treated worse than the Christians because ISIS believes that they are not a, uh, a religion of the book. So they were given two choices, convert or die. Uh, we went to a refugee camp with maybe 20,000 Yazidis. And we had uh, really, you could, you could sort of tell their story through the eyes of two people. We uh, interviewed a 19-year-old girl that had been uh, a sex slave for nearly eight months, sold for $800 to an Arab uh, man. And we had talked to a 14-year-old boy who again was captured by ISIS, was being trained to be a young jihadi. He was uh, uh, one year away from actually being trained in weapons. But they accused of him having a blas blasphemer, having a false religion, and they began to teach him the Quran. And so there's really a generation being raised up inside ISIS-controlled territory for a new generation of jihadis. And we also had the opportunity to talk to many of the Christians there, uh, Christians that had fled ISIS. Some are evangelicals that are living in many of the neighborhoods of Erbil. And we also went to a refugee camp and we sat, this was mainly Catholic uh, Christians, 
who are in that camp, but they really, uh, after a year, they're, they're getting discouraged. They, they don't want to stay in Iraq or Kurdistan. They want to leave. They want to have a productive life. You know, Chris, there was something you had mentioned before about um, the, the highway. Mm -hmm. the, the Bible ta in Isaiah talks about the highway from Assyria through That's Israel right. to Egypt and about um, someone had talked about the counterfeit highway. Exactly, a counterfeit highway uh, being built by Iran. I mean, uh, it says in Isaiah 19 about a highway between Assyria, Israel, and Egypt. That was something the Lord himself was going to build, which is actually kind of being built now with all these houses of prayer along this. But as a counterfeit, it almost seems like Iran is trying to build this bridge between Iran through Iraq to Syria, Lebanon right now, and it's sort of like a counterfeit of what the Lord proposes. And uh, I think that, again, is sort of the spiritual underpinnings of much of the conflict going on in the Middle East today. So Julie, John, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this as time goes on. Coming up, meet some of the Christians who fled ISIS one year ago and see how they're keeping the faith. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dayline. When ISIS conquered large parts of northern Iraq more than a year ago, thousands of Christians fled for their lives. Just a few days ago, we met with some of those believers in the city of Erbil, Kurdistan. As ISIS captured cities and towns, they gave Christians four choices. Leave, stay and pay the Islamic tax for non-Muslims, convert to Islam, or die. Most left. Many of the Christians who fled ISIS didn't find refuge in many of the larger refugee camps, but instead they found refuge here in small neighborhoods in Erbil and throughout Kurdistan. This is where one of the churches meets for their worship service. They come from Mosul, ancient Nineveh, and the Christian town of Karakosh, many with similar stories about ISIS. At the end of the city, ISIS had a checkpoint. They put a gun to my head and said, whatever you have in your pockets, take it out. One of our neighbors told us they killed your cousin because he was a Christian. They told us we had to leave. The transition from a normal life to a refugee has been hard. In such kind of circumstances, it's really hard for families to live all together. For example, we came here and found out we would be living in a small apartment with five or six families. It was very difficult for us. CBN News interviewed the pastor one year ago. Now he continues to shepherd his flock. First, we came here for about eight months. I was asking all the charity and humanitarian organizations to visit the people, and the only reason behind it was giving out the Word of God to the people. So God showed me His Word is not only words, but actions. Even when the electricity goes out, a common occurrence in Erbil, the service goes on. Like Christians around the world, they gratefully celebrate communion. God has moved us and saved us from Karakosh to here. That means He was faithful to us. But right now, we need a faithful heart. So please pray for us to have a faithful heart. I'm really proud of the Christians because the Christians, they left everything behind and they followed Christ. Most ask for prayer. The Christians of Iraq, they need the other parts of the world to pray for them because they are really in need spiritually, physically and emotionally. They really need to pray for us to live in peace and experience the peace of Jesus. Miriam, the 10-year-old girl seen by thousands on the internet for forgiving ISIS, came to the service, still sharing her childlike faith. Whatever situation we are in, it is because God allowed it. We don't know how to deal with this life unless we have Jesus with us. ISIS issues a new threat against the United States, and we look back at the war on Islamic terror 14 years after 9-11. This is a national health care alert from the Health Hotline. If you, a family member, or a loved one suffers from knee pain and have Medicare as your primary insurance, we've got great news. You could qualify for a pain-relieving knee brace at little or no cost to you. Get free delivery, and all the paperwork is handled by our accredited suppliers at no charge to you. If you are on Medicare and have knee pain, don't wait. 
you may qualify to immediately receive a pain relieving brace at little or no cost. Friendly agents are standing by 24 7 to help you. Call the health hotline right now for details toll free. Our friendly representatives are standing by now to take your call. We also have other pain relieving braces available for shoulder, ankle, and your back. You may be eligible to receive these items and more at little or no cost to you as well. Call right now for details toll free. Operators are standing by. Call 855-740-8143. That's 855-740-8143. Again, 855-740-8143. That's 855-740-8143. Attention Medicare beneficiaries. Health reform has added significant new benefits to Medicare plans. If you have Medicare Part A, Part B, Part D, or any Medicare Advantage plan, you now get benefits with no copays, no deductibles, and can get dental, vision, and prescription coverage included. Call the Medicare Health Reform Helpline now to make sure you have all the benefits you're entitled to. Call the Medicare Health Reform Helpline now to update your plan. Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Buckwald. The cost of health insurance and the denial of coverage because of pre-existing conditions has been a serious problem in America. But now the law has changed. Healthcare reform is now available. So many people do not take advantage of the benefits offered to them by healthcare reform because they don't call. Call now. The Medicare Health Reform Helpline is now accepting calls. Don't miss the deadline. Call the Medicare Health Reform Helpline. Call 800-315-7917. That's 800-315-7917. 800-315-7917. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dayline. ISIS says it will repeat the deadly terrorist attacks of 9-11 in a new video called We Are Back in America. The radical Muslims say they use, quote, cars full of explosives and suicide bombers. The video also shows quotes from Osama bin Laden, the man behind the 9-11 attacks, like every Muslim, from the moment they realize the distinctions in their hearts, hates Americans hates Jews and hates Christians. It also quotes bin Laden talking about declaring jihad against the U.S. government because of what he called its criminal actions. This month, the world marked the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on America, 14 years after terror was unleashed on our shores. The threat posed by radical Islam continues to grow around the world. As George Thomas reports, the enemies of America are still plotting our downfall. Fourteen years on, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are still plotting death against the enemies of Islam. Al-Qaeda has actually expanded its reach since 9-11 and is present in more countries today than it was on 9-11 when we were attacked. And unlike in 2001, experts say the terror threat today is more pervasive as terrorists, often operating in small cells or as lone wolves like the Boston bombers, are driven to murder and mayhem in the name of Islam. CBN News terrorism analyst Eric Stackelbeck says ISIS, unlike any other terror group, has mastered the call to jihad. ISIS, among the younger generation of jihadis, George, especially here in the West, ISIS is the cool thing. They're so active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. They're everywhere. ISIS is a phenomenon. And that phenomenon continues to gobble up vast swaths of territory in the Middle East, leaving behind a reign of terror and tears. We fled from ISIS and the Syrian regime. And even uh, before yesterday, uh, ISIS has entered our valley, so we had to flee. Formed in 2013, ISIS has quickly become a virulent, wealthy, transnational terror organization that is constantly recruiting. And now a U.S. official has told the BBC they're also using chemical weapons in Iraq and Syria. And they have tentacles everywhere. People don't know that they're not just in Iraq and Syria, where they already control the territory the size of Great Britain. But because they claim to be the only legitimate government among Muslims all around the world, the caliphate, Mm -hmm. they also have territory in Libya, and they have gotten the allegiance of other jihad groups in Nigeria, the Philippines, Yemen, all over the world. And remember when President Obama referred to ISIS as the JV team? Well, revelations this week by the Daily Beast that senior intelligence officials were altering reports on ISIS to fit the president's assertion that the U.S. was winning the war against them 
and other terrorists in Syria and Iraq. He wants to give the portrayal that ISIS is on the run, that US, limited U.S. airstrikes, by the way, are having a great effect on ISIS. But meanwhile, George, the facts on the ground say otherwise. But ISIS and al-Qaeda remain deeply opposed to each other, with the head of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, releasing a tape blasting ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. But the two groups remain committed to their mission against their enemies. And not to be outdone by ISIS, Al-Qaeda is out with their latest magazine. In it, the group calls for more lone wolf attacks and assassination operations against some of America's richest men, including Bill Gates, the Koch brothers, and Warren Buffett. As America remembers the horrific scenes of that day 14 years ago, authorities are still concerned about both another major terror attack as well as those lone wolf operations and the possibility that such attacks, like the ones in Paris this year and elsewhere, could become more and more common. And like 9-11, they would be carried out in the name of Islam. George Thomas, CBN News. A ministry to the deaf is taking on militant Islamists. In March, ISIS released a video aimed at recruiting deaf and mute Muslims. It featured two ISIS fighters using sign language to convince the deaf they can serve with ISIS. Now the Deaf Bible Society is responding with a video of its own. For the first time, translating the gospel message into a Middle Eastern sign language. J.R. Bucklew, the president of the Deaf Bible Society, says ISIS is preying on an isolated and vulnerable community. He says instead he wants them to learn the transforming power of the gospel. Up next, see how Jews around the world celebrate Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, with a special prayer. Welcome back. In a few days, Jews worldwide will mark Yom Kippur, the most solemn day of the Jewish year. They observe this day with both fasting and a special prayer that's significant to both Jews and Christians. It's called the Vidui, a prayer of repentance and a plea for forgiveness. The Vidui uh, is the central uh, prayer of confession uh, and for forgiveness uh, of the Jewish people on Yom Kippur. And it's a prayer that they pray, not only behalf, on behalf of themselves, but on behalf of all the Jewish people around the world. Reverend David Pelegi serves as the rector of Christ Church in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. He studied the Jewish roots of Christianity for nearly 30 years. He says the Vidui recognizes, as Jeremiah the prophet wrote, that the heart is deceitful above all things, and that deeds need to follow repentance. One thing that we, we learn from the Jewish people, uh, something quite important, especially about Yom Kippur, that it's not enough to say you're sorry. You have to confess, say you're sorry, and then at the same time take practical steps to change your behavior. The Vidui contains sections to be said both corporately and prayed by the individual. The group repeats confessions like, we sinned before you, we betrayed you, we spoke falsely. Now we want to repent and ask your forgiveness. The individual prays in part, O God and Father, maker of heaven and earth, I penitently acknowledge my sins, desiring to learn what is your will concerning me and resolving to devote myself more faithfully to your holy service. Pelagi says Christians can find a parallel between Yom Kippur and the teachings of Jesus. Now we have a uh, saying of Jesus, don't we? It says, if you bring your gift to the altar and your brother uh, has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled with your brother. Jewish tradition says, go get your relationship right with your neighbor, with your brother, with your family member, forgive and be reconciled. And then when you, on the Day of Atonement, when you begin to fast and pray, and to confess, um, God will hear your prayer and forgive you as you have forgiven others. It's the teaching of Jesus, and it's also something that's part and parcel of, uh, of Jewish tradition. And here the two line up very nicely. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us throughout the week on Facebook, Twitter, and now on Periscope. 
I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.